Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I have with me, of course, our public health director, Dr. Ngazi Azike, and this is our 2.30 update. It's been a week since we had our last update on our state's uh, efforts to acquire personal protective equipment. So I wanted to provide a quick update on PPE since March 30th. I wanna start by highlighting shipments to Illinois from the federal government. This is most often referred to at the federal level as the strategic national stockpile. Two weeks ago, I explained to you that the stated purpose of this supply is to support states and local government supplies during a public health emergency severe enough to cause local supplies to run out. In fact, I was quoting back then and just quoted to you the language that appeared on the website of the strategic national stockpile. Then at the beginning of this month, the website was changed. Suddenly, the website no longer said that the SNS would support states, but instead now said that the SNS is meant only to supplement state supplies during public health emergencies and only as a short-term stopgap buffer when the immediate supply of adequate amounts of these materials may not be immediately available. In total, the shipments that we've received from the Strategic National Stockpile of mere fraction of what we've asked for were 367,795 masks, 1 million 400 and, sorry, 1 million 141,000 surgical masks, nearly 693,000 gloves, 174,000 face shields, 142,000 surgical gowns, and 4,000 coveralls. Again, this is a small fraction of what we need and what we have asked for. If we had relied upon the White House and its obligation to fulfill our needs from the SNS, our state and nearly every state in the United States would come up short and could not protect our healthcare workers and our first responders. But here's the good news. We haven't trusted what we were told by the White House. Instead, members of my governor's office, IDPH and IEMA, have been working tirelessly to pursue all other routes to acquire additional PPE for the fight against COVID-19 in Illinois. We continue to source and ship as much PPE as we can from all over the world, bringing it to Illinois by whatever means necessary. As illustrated on one of the boards that's next to me, to date, we've ordered nearly 10 million N95 masks, over 14 million KN95 masks, 7 million surgical masks, 22 million disposable general use masks, over 19 million gloves, over 5 million face shields, over 3 million gowns, and more. Take note that this is not as simple as placing an order and having it arrive at your doorstep a few days later. There's a worldwide shortage that has us racing the clock and battling against other states and the federal government. This is an ongoing around the clock process of scouring the globe to identify what PPE is available, reaching out to the producer with a better price and a faster payment than our competitors, overcoming the machinations of shipping across the world during a worldwide pandemic, and attempting to leave nothing to chance in all of that process. We're involved in every granular detail of every step until the PPE arrives in our warehouse. We've been doing this day in and day out, again and again over the last four weeks or so. Here's why. We need to outfit our, our heroic healthcare professionals to uh, allow us to outfit them for the existing beds, but also for the additional hospital beds that we're adding all across the state. And I'll be providing a fuller update on that tomorrow. But as of Friday, we had increased hospital beds in Illinois to about 28,000 non-ICU beds and 2,680 ICU beds statewide. 
Each of those beds and all that we've added since and the patients, COVID and non-COVID alike, that need them to heal, require a full team of healthcare professionals properly outfitted in PPE in order to do their jobs correctly every day, every hour, every minute at the hospital, saving lives while they're protecting their own. Right now, we're looking at a statewide 10-day PPE burn rate of just under 1.5 million N95 masks, 25 million gloves, 4.4 million gowns, and 700,000 surgical masks. And that's just across our hospitals and long-term care facilities with small set-asides for our law enforcement to make sure that they are fully covered and our essential state workers. That's also before you count the McCormick Place alternate care facility, which we project could bring our surgical mask burn rate to over 2 million across that 10-day period to just offer one more example. As you can see, when you compare our federal shipments to our burn rate, the product that we've received from the federal stockpile will last only a handful of days in this multi-month battle. It's our own state procurement initiative that is making the difference. To anyone who wants a response to some of the blame shifting coming out of the White House, all I have to say is look at the numbers. Here in Illinois, I'm doing everything within my power as governor to keep the PPE supply stream flowing. I have enormous respect and gratitude, truly, for the civil servants inside of IEMA and IDPH who are managing inventory in our state PPE warehouses and sending it out to hospitals and local health departments so that every part of the state gets what they need. I'm also grateful to the people within my governor's office who've launched a whirlwind, all-encompassing operation to analyze the global PPE market and chase down every last product that they can find. And a big thank you to the incredible, truly, incredible experience public servants inside of FEMA, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Army Corps, and the entire U.S. military. The people who know that their duty is to the residents of this country. These are all people who are fighting like hell for Illinois, even with one hand tied behind their backs by the White House. To all who are listening, I just want to say I know that this fight has taken on a new meaning as COVID-19's presence in our communities has evolved. Less than a month ago, it was hard for everyone to see how important early action would be to get us ready for what has seemed like an invisible enemy whose terrible impact had not yet been truly demonstrated. We have now lost hundreds of Illinoisans in the fight against COVID-19. Thousands of family members, loved ones, friends, and neighbors are grieving. The loss of each and every single individual offers a unique, unbearable pain for all of the lives that they touched. And cumulatively, they reflect the disproportionate burden that this virus places on some communities more than others. We're facing a crisis, and we have to face it honestly. Communities of color, and particularly black communities in the city of Chicago, suburban Cook County, and cities and towns all across our state, disproportionately shoulder the healthcare conditions that lead to worse outcomes with COVID-19. And to put into words what often is left unsaid, that's a product of generations of systemic disinvestment in communities of color compounded by disparities in healthcare delivery systems and access. Acknowledging that truth is just one step. Our actions have to reflect our reality. The number one way to do that is testing. As I've said since the beginning, the lack of testing at a national level over the last few months has been a massive hindrance to our ability to respond to and contain COVID-19. I've called out the federal government and called upon them to step up in the ways that only they can. But in the meantime, my team has worked to expand testing where we have the ability to do so and ensure that we're not testing any one community more than any other community. 
That means adding more drive-through testing facilities, working with rapid test companies, and building up our own in-state lab capacities. As I've said, we're not where we need to be, but we are determined to get to a place where we're testing widely in our nursing homes, in our correctional facilities, and in our communities, where anyone who might need one can get a test. That's our goal. We also have worked to massively expand hospital capacity directly in communities where we predict we need to exceed our existing capacity. We've added thousands of beds at our existing institutions and are standing up supportive facilities at McCormick Place, at Westlake Hospital in Melrose Park, Metro South Hospital in Blue Island, and in other locations across Illinois. My team and I are continuing to operate with our eyes trained on these disparities because that is the only way to address them. We are working to hold ourselves accountable in everything that we do. That said, I say again to you, our strongest weapon against COVID-19 is you, all of you, all of the people of the state of Illinois. We have to be all in for Illinois. So please stay home and work from home if you can. If you have to leave home because you are an essential worker and if you're sick or a member of your family is sick, this is not a time to tough it out. Isolate if you can. See a doctor, call a doctor first if your symptoms are severe. Hold your family members accountable. Just about every insurance company is waiving copays related to COVID-19, making it easier for any person who has symptoms to get the treatment that they need. Please protect yourself and your community. We can't quantify your actions like we can PPE and available tests, but I promise you we can't get through this without all of us, all of us doing our part. I thank you and I want to call upon Dr. Zike for today's medical update. Thank you, Governor. Good, good afternoon. I'd like to begin today with a few words of caution. The forecast says that tomorrow will be our warmest day in many areas of the state. Please stay home. I assure you, if people congregate tomorrow, we will set the state back in our fight against COVID-19. Today, we announced 1,006 new cases, including 33 additional lost lives. We currently have a total of 12,262 cases and 307 Illinoisans who were loved by many who have passed on. 70% of the individuals who have lost their fight against COVID have, list, have, been, have had a comorbid condition. The most commonly listed conditions were hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. We're looking for the data on some the other 30%, but feel that it would likely bear out the same information that the majority of individuals, the overwhelming majority of individuals have comorbid conditions. As the governor discussed, personal protective equipment is used every day by healthcare personnel to protect themselves, the patients, and the others when providing care. Shortages of these essential supplies are currently posing a tremendous challenge to the U.S. healthcare system, and healthcare facilities are having difficulty. Because of this shortage, healthcare facilities are beginning to implement optimization and contingency strategies to help stretch our supplies. These include healthcare personnel using face masks beyond contact with a single patient. Of course, if there's any obvious soiling of equipment, that needs to be changed immediately. These strategies must be employed during PPE shortages. We must protect our healthcare personnel. When our workforce is sick, they cannot care for you or your parents or your grandparents. We've been saying this for weeks and we'll continue to say it. Please stay at home. Protect our healthcare workers and the limited supply of PPE currently available. You don't want to be the person that spreads the virus to a healthcare worker. Everyone's actions matter. They're critical. Stay inside. If you absolutely must go out, 
please cover your nose and mouth. Many people are celebrating the most important event of their faith this week, but the services must be held online. Lastly, beginning today, the number of COVID-19 cases by zip code will be available on the IDPH website at dph.illinois.gov forward slash COVID-19 forward slash statistics. It should be assumed, however, that COVID-19 is occurring in every zip code in Illinois. But for our website, zip codes with five cases or less will not be shared due to privacy concerns and the concern for identifying an individual. We must always be disciplined to ensure that we remain safe. We must continue to stay home. We must wash our hands, keep practicing our physical distancing and wearing a covering. These are the tools and the keys that we have, and that is what will make us successful. Let's use these weapons to fight against this war. We have to end this pandemic. Let's be all in for Illinois. Now I'll summarize comments for a Spanish speaking population. Buenos tardes. Me gustaría comenzar hoy con una, algunas palabras de precaución. Mañana será nuestro día más caluroso en muchas áreas, áreas del estado. Por favor, por favor, te lo ruego, quédense en casa. Les aseguro que si la gente sale mañana, va a ser un golpe a nuestra lucha contra COVID-19. Hoy, IDPH anuncia 1,006 nuevos casos de COVID-19 incluidas 33 muertes adicionales. Tenemos un total de 12,262 casos y 307 muertes aquí en Illinois. El 70% de las personas tienen condición comorbidas, la hipertensión, diabetes y enfermedades de cardíacas se encuentra con frecuencia. Como dijo el gobernador, Los trabajadores médicos utilizan el equipo de protección personal para protegerse ellos mismos, a los pacientes y a otras personas cuando dan atención. La verdad es que necesito ese equipo para todos. Los médicos están comenzando a implementar estrategias para extender la vida de este equipo importante. Estas estrategias no son ideales ideales, pero pueden son necesarios durante nuestra respuesta a esta pandemia. Debemos proteger a nuestros trabajadores médicos. Si ellos se enferman, no pueden atender a los pacientes. Lo hemos dicho bastante estas semanas y lo vamos a seguir diciendo. Quédense en casa. Proteja a nuestros trabajadores médicos y su equipo de protección personal. Usted no quiere estar la persona que transmite el virus a un trabajador médico o cualquier otra persona. Tu comportamiento es crucial. Es imperativo que con muchas personas celebrando su fe esta semana, los servicios deben ser por internet. También debo anunciar hoy la disponibilidad de datos por código postal. A partir de hoy, el número de casos de COVID-19 por código postal estará disponible en el sitio web de IDPH en dph.illinois.gov forward slash COVID-19 forward slash statistics. Se debe suponer que la exposición a COVID-19 puede ocurrir en cada código postal. Los códigos postales con cinco casos y menos no se comparten debido a problemas de privacidad. Siempre debemos ser disciplinados para asegura, asegurarnos de ser seguros, continuar quedarse en casa, lavarse las manos y seguir practicando su distanciamiento social. Estas son las claves del éxito. Úsenlos para que podamos poner fin a esta pandemia. And with that, I will turn it over to our governor. Thank you. 
I feel like by the end of this, we're, I'm going to be able to know every uh, medical term in Spanish. So um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azique. Yes, happy to take any questions. Thank you, there. Governor. Um, from the White House, the, uh, Dr. Bricks has been saying no grocery store for the next two weeks, nothing. Stay home completely. <laughs> Should Illinoisans follow that advice? I had not heard her say that, but I um, I understand exactly what she's saying, you know, that if you can stock up, and we've talked about this before when we did the stay-at-home order to begin with, that people should try to stock up for a period of time, 14 days, you know, if they can. Certainly, the less interaction that people have over an extended period of time, the more likely it is that we're going to be bending this curve. We already are seeing some evidence that, you know, that what we've done with the stay-at-home order, with keeping kids away from school, with closing down bars and restaurants and so on has had an impact but anything that people can do i think this is great advice including as you've seen there's no order to wear a mask outside but i've encouraged everybody to do so and i i don't know if you've noticed there are quite a number of people uh, who are doing so in fact a number of you in the room um, and so i think any of these uh, you know methods any of these moves uh, by people to stay at home and stay away from crowds is a an excellent idea would you consider perhaps stricter measures whether that be a curfew, whether that be I mean, shortening the hours of some of these essential businesses, uh, you know, only one person per household leaving, leaving the home to do those things. Yes, I would. I mean, I, the answer is we try to look at all of these things all the time where, you know, you want to balance people's civil liberties and, and our need to, you know, to stay at home and to, to defeat this virus. Um, and, I, you know, my greatest concern is I think where people see, you know, I, I hope that people will listen to Dr. Azike about the weather tomorrow very important. Please do not head to the lakefront. Please do not go congregating in a park. It's fine if you have a backyard to go into your backyard. If you, you know, to walk outside of your home, of course, a beautiful day, but do not go meet people. Do not. Um, but to your point, I mean, I, there are lots of things that we can do to, you know, to, to limit people's gathering and uh, conveying this virus to one another. And we, of course, are considering them all the time. Um, but I, you know, had not heard what Dr. Bricks had said, and I think it's probably an excellent idea um, for people to follow. One of the items not listed, um, ventilators. However, the White House has sent 450 the state has requested more than 4,000 yes where are you going to get the ventilators you need so we're day in and day out we are on the phone with companies that have ventilators companies that could uh, provide ventilators to us so some that manufacture ventilators I've been on the phone with the uh, head of uh, Ford Motor Company which is about to come out with their version of a, a ventilator uh, with General Motors or at least the people who are coordinating the effort for General Motors uh, to gather to get those ventilators if we can I've talked to the head of Viare a company that's based here in Illinois that makes ventilators so we're doing everything we can I'm just one person that's been on the phone around ventilators um, we've also collected up ventilators from places that you might not normally expect to, to have one. There are dental offices sometimes, just in the event that somebody has a problem. You know, it's very unusual, right? But many dentists will keep a ventilator around anyway. Surgery centers, um, where elective surgeries had taken place uh, that are not open today, right? They all, many of the most of them had ventilators. Um, so we've really talked to as many people as we can to get the ventilators. And look, there, there aren't, it isn't like there's an endless supply of ventilators. You've heard this, I think, from the other governors as well. Um, and I'm hopeful that there are states that will have a decline in the need for ventilators that will provide those for us. Today, we're doing okay with regard to ventilators. We have to watch the number of hospitalizations, watch the number of uh, people who go into ICU beds, and that's kind of a progression that we see, that if you see that increasing, you know that your ventilator needs are going to increase. So we're watching it every day and keeping count. Do you have a number? Because uh, it's not here on the board. I think we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, we'll provide you an update, and I don't want to get the numbers wrong, so we'll, we'll give that to you tomorrow. Dr. Azike, yesterday you talked about there will be some issues that we will see for years to come. What, what issues are you talking about? Well, just start with the deaths. Okay, we have people of all ages that are passing away, and we know how destabilizing that will be to the families that they have come from. Some of them may have been the primary breadwinners for families. So 
you know, just the trauma of losing a loved one, we know that that can have far-reaching consequences. So beyond just that, we know that um, there are maybe people who don't pass away but then have ongoing medical problems associated with the COVID-19. Um, we know that the, the unemployment, all the things that we're experiencing as a result of having to fight this deadly pandemic, um, we know unemployment, we know even the people who've been out of school, all these issues are going to have consequences that, of course, the government is going to be working hard to make, you know, to ameliorate the situation, but it's not something that, okay, the pandemic is over and we flip a switch and now everything is back to normal. You know, the programs that IDPH, DHS, so many programs that we already had out in the community, they're not doing those programs anymore. So the beneficiaries of all those uh, programs, they're not getting them anymore. Um, we know that people maybe are not getting, you know, elective procedures that maybe they, needed, you know, maybe there's somebody's needed a mammogram, like there's just so many things that we are then going to have to clean up afterwards. Um, and so, of course, we are all going to be in that struggle together to make those necessary adjustments. But, you know, with people having, you know, financial bankruptcy in, in many cases, um, people being, you know, e even the people who are not evicting their tenants but haven't received any rent payments, like everybody in all sectors are going to be affected. And so we're going to have to work doubly hard even after this is over to rebuild um, from the damage that's been created by this unprecedented event. We'll do a couple more in the room and then we've got some on. Yeah, Governor, the president last night said, uh, what well, he said a couple of things, but he said <laughs> that in, term, in regards to McCormick Place specifically, he said, quote, federal government's going to have to staff it or probably will end up staffing it. That's not, not something we heard on Friday. Is that in fact the case? We did hear this afternoon, I did, that uh, we will be receiving some federal medical staff. It hasn't been made clear that they'll be in McCormick Place, um, but we, we were notified that, in fact, there are federal uh, army uh, and other military uh, medical staff that will be made available to us in the state of Illinois. So I'm very pleased to hear that. And as to where they're going to be assigned, we haven't yet had that conversation. One more question in the room. Could I ask you about, it might seem silly, but there is uh, some criticism today to the mayor for having a hairdresser come to her and having her hair cut. Mm -hmm. What are you doing about a haircut? Have you had a haircut? What do you think that folks should do who are not able to go to the hairdresser? They see the mayor has had a private haircut and they're upset. Well, I, I, I can't speak to the situation of the mayor's haircut, but I will say I have not had a haircut since before the stay at home uh, rule uh, was put in place. I, I, I actually feel like I'm getting a little shaggy. Um, I'm going to turn into a hippie at some point here. My hair grows pretty fast. So uh, I, I, maybe I'll learn how to, to uh, use a Floby uh, or something else to cut my own hair. But um, look, I mean, this is, these are some of the consequences that I think we're all having to experience. I know that there are things that people might normally buy, makeup that you might go to a makeup counter somewhere to get that you can't get anymore because those stores are closed, um, uh, you know, or other other items of, you know, personal use and personal hygiene may, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, everybody's making sacrifices here. And I'm sure that, you know, whatever the mayor did, she did in a, a way that is safe for everybody and for her, for the people who may have, you know, done, you know, or dressing her hair, you know, doing her haircut. Okay. We'll go to some questions online. Governor, you said at least twice the last time on March 5th that the risk to the general public remains low. Why did you say that? On what were you basing that? When did you change your mind? Well, I was listening to the CDC, um, and what I heard from the CDC was that the, gen the risk to the general public was low, and I, I think the CDC is a terrific organization, mostly has gotten things right over the many years uh, that I've been alive, um, and uh, so I, I believed what they were saying, and I was repeating that. I think, um, I still think it's a great organization. I think that for whatever reason at the federal government level i think perhaps um, decisions being made at the white house they weren't giving very strong advice about what to do proactively to address covid 19. Um, but as you know we took early actions without the cdc and i'm hoping 
uh, and praying that those actions are, you know, uh, delivering good results for the state of Illinois. Regarding the IDES program, are there plans for a loan to fill up the fund or impose new payroll taxes to cover depleting funds? And should Congress step in to beef up employment ranks to handle all the phone calls? Um, well, those are two separate questions, but um, first question, you know, do we need to replenish the IDES fund for unemployment? Of course we do. Um, and how we'll do that, I think, is going to be a, a somewhat dependent upon uh, the economic recovery that will occur post-COVID or as we're trying to recover from COVID uh, and what the federal government does in terms of its next relief packages. Uh, but there's no doubt that we're going to have to refill the coffers of those trust funds. What steps are being taken to shore up state spending in anticipation of the crater in state revenues? Is your administration implementing any cutback of services or staff reductions? Um, I, I also wanted to answer, sorry, the last half of the last question, which was about uh, the, the calls into IDES and can we get federal help for that? The answer is no, and I, we can't get federal help. We're not, you know, we're barely getting federal help for everything else that we need, um, I, I, uh, in terms of personnel anyway. Um, and right now it's all focused on uh, the medical staffing and healthcare uh, professionals. I, I, we are trying to hire up at IDES um, and to use any uh, workers that we can that work at IDES who aren't normally on the phones to have them answering phones. But you can only, one person can only take about 30 calls a day, as I understand it, just because of the complexity of filing for unemployment. And so, you know, there are, there are sometimes 100,000 calls coming in in a day. And that's why we've tried to tell people you need to go to the website and you need to spread spread yourselves out from day to day. And, you know, we're doing everything we can to try to process those as fast as possible. Um, I'm sorry, I was back on that question, but you were. What steps are being taken to shore up state spending? Oh, state finances, yeah. Um, so I, first of all, this is, I mean, it's unprecedented in terms of the state, even compared to uh, 2008, 2009, um, the revenue shortfall, the things that we're having to do to address this, um, you know, is creating a gap that I don't think anybody could have anticipated. Uh, so we are looking very hard at what we need to do to to get the revenues and, uh, and expenditures in line with one another. Um, I think a lot of it is going to depend upon the federal government. I mean, there's just no one else who can step in um, the, you know, to help our state finances the way that the federal government can. It already has done one package, this relief package three that was passed that Senator Durbin was so instrumental in, uh, which is providing funding uh, directly to the state to reimburse us for COVID expenses um, and to the cities also to reimburse their COVID expenses, but it's not enough. Um, and you heard Andrew Cuomo, I think, at the very time that was being passed, saying that's not enough. And I said at the time, it's a good start. Um, it's just a different way of approaching half full or half empty uh, the glass. And uh, uh, the truth is, it's it, you know we are going to need more. Every state is going to need more because this is you know the, every state's revenues have cratered. With African Americans representing a disproportionate number of COVID-19 fatalities, what plan does the administration have to attack this problem? Any theory about why blacks are being hit harder? Well, I, you know, there's a rumor around that, uh, first there was a rumor, also very false, uh, that uh, African Americans were, I read this uh, recently in a, in a um, serious publication, that, th uh, that there was a rumor that African Americans were immune um, and I hope people didn't read that uh, or understand that, but that is a rumor that was put around, put out on social media. Um, and uh, so that obviously is false. Um, the flip side is also false that, that uh, this, uh, this adversely affects African-Americans because COVID-19 by its very nature, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, has some um, disproportionate effect on the African-American community. Here's the reason that we think that it has a disproportionate effect on the African-American community. It's the things that, that Dr. Ezekiel was saying and that I was saying, underlying conditions that exist, the poor health care uh, that, that has been provided, you know, because of uh, years of disinvestment in communities of color, those have uh, both come together. This virus has had this terrible effect on the African-American community because of those two things. Um, when there are, you know, a large number 
outnumber people in the African American community with diabetes and with hypertension. And those are comorbidities that can cause um, you know, greater problems with, with COVID-19, um, together with the idea that there, there aren't, um, the safety net hospitals are challenged in our state uh, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, availability of healthcare in communities of color has been at a lower quality or lower availability than uh, in other communities. So those have worked together. So we are countering it both by reopening hospitals that are in those communities. So you've seen us working on uh, reopening those uh, as well as uh, by making sure that we're messaging properly. We're using social media and our all in Illinois campaign to, uh, to message uh, directly into the African American American community uh, about stay at home, about making sure that people are washing their hands, that they're you know wiping down surfaces, and all of the other things that we've asked people to do. Can you confidently say your administration is doing all it can to stop the spread of COVID-19 among incarcerated populations? How many incarcerated youth have been released from DJJ, and how many adults have been released from IDOC? I don't know the DJJ numbers. Uh, I can uh, tell you that I've seen recently, I've seen the numbers uh, that since, um, you know, essentially in the last some number of weeks, I think it's six to eight weeks, we've, uh, we have uh, gone through files and uh, uh, reviewed, n n you know, uh, nonviolent offenders and any opportunity that we can to early release people that, that are not a danger to their communities or not likely to be opposing a danger to their communities. And as a result, we're, we have more than 1,100 fewer people incarcerated in our Department of Corrections today than we did at the beginning of February. February, and that actually brings us to a level uh, that is equivalent to where we were in 1995, a low uh, that we were at in 1995. We can do more, and we are looking at doing more. I am doing more. Um, that's in terms of just looking at, at offenders who are at near the end of their term. Uh, there's more that we need to do and of course we've provided uh, lots of resources to the department of corrections to make sure that they could separate populations you may have heard at stateville we have uh, national guardsmen who've set up medical tents um, in their gym uh, as i understand and so that they could separate people who have covid from people who don't um, so we're we're making a lot of effort is it everything that we can do I'm trying to do everything that we can do, and every idea is, you know, is not immediately a bad one. In fact, I'll take, you know, good ideas, and they can come from anywhere. But, but we are relying upon experts to tell us how best to deal with this in incarcerated populations. What are your thoughts about Illinoisans still planning to travel Wednesday to celebrate Passover and this weekend to celebrate Easter? You've clearly discouraged residents to stay home. Um, and maintain social distancing, but do you have a specific message for those wanting to celebrate with their family anyway? Will there be any sort of enforcement mechanism to ensure there is no needless travel in the coming weeks? Look, I understand the desire to worship. Um, uh, Passover is coming up. Um, we're in Easter week. Uh, this is this is a holy important holy time of year uh, and I want very much for people to experience the spirituality that they normally would we live in a very difficult time and uh, I would suggest that unfortunately we're we all should start to think about how we're going to use technology in order for us to gather, in order to hear our pastor or a rabbi, uh, you know, or our imam or whoever we worship with, you know, to listen uh, to them and to worship online, perhaps by video or by phone, um, and to connect with family in the same way. It's very important if your family doesn't live with you and you normally would get together for the holidays, this is a time when you've got to look for you know another way to do it. I've heard people using Zoom. Um, there's a, a funny term I've heard for Passover Seder, a Zader, a Zoom Seder. Um, and I think that we're all going to be experiencing the holidays 
holidays uh, in a very unusual ways this year, but it's very important. I cannot reiterate this enough. It is very important that you stay home. It is very important that you do not gather in a place of worship or in somebody's home with, um, you know, with other families or even with your family if they don't live with you. Um, it's We've got to protect each other and this will not last forever, but this is one Easter, one Passover that you're going to have to uh, do something unusual on the way that you worship and I ask you please to do that for all of us. This will be our last question. You said last week that you'd exhausted nearly every step at the state level to slow COVID-19 spread. On Sunday you mentioned some other measures such as temperature checks. When would those steps become necessary? I think what we're trying to do is, is again, keep a balance. So this question was asked a little bit earlier. There's a, a balance between, you know, uh, not trying not to impose on everybody's civil liberties, uh, and at the same time trying to defeat this virus. And uh, so I'm evaluating that every day. And I think the triggers would be if people are just not living by the rules, we'd have to enforce them uh, to a greater extent. Um, you know, especially around the holidays here, nobody wants to have police, um, you know, patrolling uh, the parking lots of churches or of synagogues um, or of mosques to, you know, to to uh, break people up, um, you know, this, it's not, it's not right. It's not fair to the police officers either. Um, and we just, we all need, we are in this together. We all need to step up and do the right thing, even at this time of year, especially at this time of year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.